Hey guys. This is part 9 of what if Naruto died and became a hollow. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. Chapter 37, Zoro Y Frieza The archives of Lost Noches were a new feature implemented after Barrigan's kingdom had fallen, located immediately to the right of Sales Chambers, where the research wing was located. It was a large room, about as long and wide as the main throne room, stacked with many shelves worth of information that had been gathered from both Soul Society and Hueco Mundo. Most importantly, it contained Aizen's records on individual Shinigami, their strengths and weaknesses, and their combat abilities. The only Shinigami missing from the archives were the profiles of the commanders themselves. A large monitor, product of sale hung in the back of the room. Armed with technology from the 12th Division's Research and Development Institute, he had easily managed to get a feed into Soul Society itself. It would have been nice if they could keep tabs a little bit earlier, but Sale had just made his breakthrough a few years back, so they were out of luck. Naruto sat in the large chair in front of the monitor, the file on Yamamoto Genryu Saishigakuni spilled out in front of him. Out of all the Shinigami and Aizen's records, the Sotaishu had by far the biggest profile. It was amazing how far Aizen went into detail on the guy, and Naruto mused it was most likely as a result of using his Kyuka Sujetsu. So that's what he has planned for the Sotaishu. Using an errand card to achieve the purpose, well I can't say I wouldn't do the same in his position. I'll have to look into this, but he'll probably create this wonder why soon. He folded his hands in front of him, putting Yamamoto's profile to the side. He pressed a button on the side of the monitor, watching as the screen lit up. He typed in a few codes, and the static turned into a much more vivid view of what was happening within Soul Society. So, after all these decades of waiting, Aizen finally decided to reveal himself. Soul Society will be on our case sooner or later he remarked, focusing in on Sukioka Hill. Aizen had just trashed these two Shinigami kids, an orange-haired one and a red-haired one. After that had happened, another one of the captains showed up and attacked Aizen, but he was defeated almost as easily with a kid as spell. It looked like even the captains weren't as strong as he thought they would be. Aizen was an exception. He heard a little bit of rumbling in the distance, and noticed that the Jillian were getting ready. On the screen, it looked like Aizen and his cohorts had gotten captured by the Shinigami. It would be nice if they just offed him right now, but then I wouldn't benefit from that at all. Naruto remarked, as Aizen grinned on screen. A column of light fell from the sky and engulfed all three rogue captains, and a tear opened in the sky, showing all the Jillian that resided within. Negation. Of course that's how they would get away, he commented as the three captains disappeared into Hueco Mundo with a flashy exit. They would be back here before long, all three of them. Usually there was just one of them here at any given time. This made it a little more difficult to move. The wars this winter. We're gonna have to make our move soon, when he's ready to attack Soul Society. He should have the Hugyoka by now. It will be a useful tool, especially if the Libro de Ciclos is accurate in its abilities. The Hugyoku is supposedly a more advanced form of the Bolus de Evolution. It should be able to power an already evolved Erenkar up. Even despite that, the abilities of our Erenkar are already far beyond Soul Society's expectations. Aizen is probably going to reveal them to the world this fall. I'm going to have to take care so that Soul Society gets as little information as possible on the army. Naruto gathered up the papers on Yamamoto and thought back to that valuable book that he had found in the bowels of his kingdom. It was one trump card that he had over Aizen, because the Lord of Lost No Chase didn't know about it. Which meant he had no idea about the secrets that it contained. When it came to that knowledge, Aizen's plan to obtain the Ukan almost seemed a little laughable. He placed the file back on the shelf, before he swung the door open and entered the hall. Aizen would definitely want a meeting after this. Kurosaki Ichigo had never felt so unlucky in his entire life. While it was true he had managed to save Rukia and defeat her brother, Kachiki Bayakuya, things immediately went south from there. 
Ichigo had learned that he had been used the entire time by a captain in the Godiai 13, so he could retrieve something that he called the Hugyoku, which happened to be located within Rukia's body. He had extracted the damn thing as soon as he had showed up, but it looked like he was going to be defeated when Yoruchi and another captain whom he didn't know put a sword to his neck. Aizen managed to turn the tables yet again though, when the Minos Grande opened a rift in Soul Society and drew him in with their negation, pretty much making the former captain untouchable. He had saved Rukia's life, but in the process had gained an enemy that could threaten everything that he held dear. An enemy with a whack job planned to merge the boundaries between Shinigami and Hollow, and ascend to a greater plane of existence. While Ichigo and his friends rested in the 4th Division's barracks a few days after the battle, Soul Society was now in much deeper turmoil. They had lost three captains in an instant, an event unheard of since the visor defection 100 years prior. The Godii 13 was in need of promotions, and it was in need of promotions fast. But with the Central 46 dead at the hands of Aizen, there was a massive void in the power that made decisions around Suriidei difficult. Shit, what happens now? Ichigo asked himself, as he lay awake in his personal bed in the infirmary. Soul Society would probably send them back in a few days after everyone had recovered, but then there was the matter of Aizen. Things probably weren't going to work out so easily in his favor. Yo, I see you're up early today, came a cool voice from outside the window. Ichigo grunted, the voice bringing him out of his thoughts. The orange-haired teenager turned towards the window, where Kakashi was standing on the windowsill. Kakashi, Ichigo said in acknowledgement. The silver-haired shinobi turned Shinigami had been one of the first opponents Ichigo had to face within Soul Society. The Ryoka boy had fought the third seat of the fifth division directly after his fight with Ikaku. Kakashi's proficient usage of Kida had kept Ichigo at a disadvantage the entire fight but he managed to come out on top after he had gathered up enough willpower to eliminate fear from his strikes. The silver-haired Shinigami opened up his robes, showing a multitude of bandages across his chest and abdomen. You really did a number on us back there. I don't think I've ever seen a single Shinigami defeat so many strong opponents in such a short period of time. The Sotaishu will definitely want to keep tabs on your growth now, especially with the whole fiasco with Aizen. I think you'll become a valuable ally in the long run, he explained. With three captains gone rogue, Suriidei is in a weaker condition than it has ever been before. Aizen must take a full year in awakening the Hugyoku before he can use it, which means we have only a year to prepare for his attack. We have time, but it's not much. What we need to focus on now is filling the positions missing after Aizen's defection, and continue to harness the abilities of our allies. So, what do you want me to do about it? I'm not supposed to tell you this, but it looks like you'll be getting in contact with us sooner rather than later. Although, whether Aizen's goons get to you sooner is another matter. Kakashi leapt into the room, tired of standing on the windowsill. The captains are holding a meeting right now as we speak. I believe the subject matter has something to do with the promotion of several Shinigami to captains, but you'll inevitably be brought up in their conversation, he said. Ichigo looked at him funnily, like he didn't understand why. Meanwhile, the meeting between the ten remaining captains of Soul Society had just gone underway. Yamamoto banged his staff against the ground, calling to attention the group. He looked less than happy. With the defection of 5th Division Captain Aizen Sasuke, as well as 3rd Division Captain Ikimaru Jin and 9th Division Captain Tosin Kanaim, the Godii 13 is in a critical state. With the Hugyoku at his disposal, Aizen Sasuke has become the greatest threat to both soul society and the human world. We must take immediate action if we are to purge this menace. The captain commander gave pause. The first order in business is the replacement of the three captains that have betrayed soul society. With the Central 46 effectively out of commission, I will be the one to oversee the promotion process alongside two other captains. He opened his eyes and looked at them all intently. If any one of you has any recommendations, please let me know immediately, he said, as the captains contemplated the decision amongst themselves. A few of them already knew who they were going to pick. Several months later, Minato walked around the Suriidei in a slump, his duties for the day already finished. Being both the vice captain and the acting captain meant double the workload, and he couldn't ask anyone else to take it off his hands. 
The rest of the squad was understandably bummed out ever since Captain Aizen's defection, most notably 4th C. Tinamori. Good evening, Namikaze Fukutechu, greeted two female Shinigami in his division who were lounging in the street. They were carrying a couple brooms, but it was obvious that they were slacking off. Yeah, he said, too tired to even scold them. He seemed to do that a lot these days, with his increased workload and the fact that his kids had recently left the house. It couldn't be helped. They were physically 21 years old now, and they had been accepted into that division. Their parents couldn't have been more proud. After a few more minutes of walking, he turned a corner which led to the 5th Division's barracks. He opened the sliding door gently, careful not to disturb anyone who was already asleep. A few Shinigami were running around doing chores, and they didn't even bother to stop and greet him. Not that it mattered, of course. His office was at the end of the hallway, which he had renovated ever since the captain had left. He sort of liked his old one better, but he couldn't really complain. In his hands he held a stack of paperwork, the product of a full day's work when it came to be a vice-captain. He clutched the doorknob and turned it lightly, and before he entered the room he was well aware of the presence. However, it wasn't the vastly powerful hollow or a captain as one might expect to be present in a room such as this. Rather, it was a random, faceless Shinigami that was in the room. He wasn't even a seated officer, and overall his features just seemed kind of forgettable. He was here to deliver a message to Minato, though. The nameless, faceless Shinigami bowed to the 5th Division's vice-captain, getting onto one knee and producing a message. Congratulations, Namikaze Fukutechu. The test results for the captain's trial have come in, and you have been accepted as the new captain of the 5th Division. All you must do now is attend the initiation ceremony in order to make it official, he said. Minato's face split into a wide grin, and the vice-captain turned captain enthusiastically walked forward and clapped his hands against the messenger's shoulders. The messenger looked a little bothered and disgruntled from the sudden contact, but he didn't say anything. Thank you? I've been waiting to hear the news on that for weeks now. I mean it, thank you. This is wonderful news, being a captain will undoubtedly be an amazing experience, he said, his voice a little flustered. The other Shinigami nodded frantically, his eyes wide with bewilderment as Minato's joy washed over him. The blonde Shinigami removed his hands and threw his paperwork to the side carefully. He then rushed out of the open door, presumably to tell the world the news. He rushed down the street in a spasm, eager to find his wife. As he rushed through the third division's barracks, several Shinigami called out to him to stop. Yet he only waved brightly at them and continued to run. Kushina, he shouted as he barged into her office. The red-haired woman turned to him and smirked, and Minato's eyes widened in surprise as he noticed the Hayori clutched in her hands. Naruto clutched a memo as he walked through the halls of Lost No Chase. He punched the head off of a random errand car without even looking up from the paper. The shock on the figure's face didn't disappear, even in death. So, Barrigan's been demoted to Tercera, has he? Who in the hell is this Stark kid, and how do I know if he has what it takes to be the Segunda? He asked himself, crunching the paper in his hand. So, Yami has taken the spot of the Decima, I guess? I've heard his first mission was to be sent to the human world to check up on some Shinigami kid. He pondered, as his eyes narrowed when he read something on the paper. Apparently they had been sent to some place called Karakura Town, which apparently was some kind of special spiritually aware city in the human world. The hell? Siro Espada? Him? You've gotta be fucking kidding me. Maybe Aizen just gave him the spot to satisfy his ego. He's not the type of Arankar who would accept anything less than the strongest position. Although, Siro Espada is rather fitting for an Arankar like him. It means he's nothing after all. I'll make sure to dissolve that ridiculous rank when I regain control. Speaking of that mission of his, Alquiora and Yami were due back to Las Noches right now. That was the purpose of him being called over to the General Arankar meeting hall. It could be an important finding. He opened the door to the meeting hall. It was dark inside as usual. Despite all that, it didn't mean that the room was completely vacant or anything. In fact, he could already sense no less than twenty other presences in there, from both Espada and non-Espada Arankar. Welcome. 
Naruto, Aizen's voice rang out from the back of the room. Even though he should have gotten used to it by now, it still had an infuriating tone to it. Naruto grunted in response, the surly Erenkar going to the opposite end of the room from Aizen and sitting down next to one of Grimjou's fraction and Grimjou himself. Now the only Erenkar yet to arrive were Okuyora and Yami themselves. Never mind, here they were now. The door had closed as soon as it had opened, and the two Erenkar took the spotlight in the center of the room, away from all the other Erenkar on the side. Welcome back. Okuyora. Yami. Please tell us your findings here, in front of your twenty brothers and sisters. Aizen said smoothly. Yes, Aizen-sama. Okuyora said. Naruto repressed the urge to whistle, and then scratched his blood-red whisker marks. Okuyara had really gotten that whole loyal minion voice down. It was pretty convincing. No one even flinched as Okuyara plucked out his left eye from its socket, holding it at arm's length and crushing it as if it were glass. A nifty little trick he had picked up from his mass days. Naruto looked around. The other Arankar were really soaking in the information. The fox Arankar rubbed his pointed mask fox ears before he too closed his eyes. There were a few humans that had tried their luck against Yami after he had used Gonzui, but they were cleaned up so easily it wasn't even funny. Honestly, Yami smacked him once, and it broke the kid's weird arm in two. Then the orange-haired girl attempted to use some fly thing on Yami, which was crushed without a second thought. She fell to pieces after that. But after this, the orange-haired kid showed up. The same one he had seen when he was viewing Soul Society, where he along with the red-haired one had gotten destroyed by Aizen himself. He watched as the orange-haired kid he had seen before clash swords with the two Espada. He seemed to be beating Yami at first, before something happened to him, and he lost it completely. Yami took advantage of this and kicked the kid's ass. After that, opponents Naruto wasn't expecting showed up out of the woodwork. Yurahara Kijur and Shihuin Yorichi to be exact. Yorichi then took Yami to town, completely overwhelming him while Yurihara also joined in the fray a little. Okuyora retreated into Hueco Mundo after that, effectively saving Yami any further humiliation. I see. So the reason you chose not to kill him was because you felt he was worthless? Aizen guessed. Okuyora nodded, his left eye growing back in its place. Yes. It is impossible that this child would not stand in the way of our goals, and it would be a waste of time to bother ourselves further with him. In addition to that, Okuyara was cut off. Don't give me that shit. Naruto looked over to the right, where Grimjaw was sitting a few seats away. It figured that he would be the one to speak up in this kind of situation. If I ran into such a weak shit like that, I would have killed him in one attack. No matter how much a piece of garbage he was, the word kill appeared in your orders, didn't it? That means you should have killed him without hesitation. I agree. This applies to any enemy. Even if there is no value in killing them, there certainly is no value in letting them live as well, piped up Shalom. More importantly, Yami, you got your ass kicked, didn't you? He wasn't worth killing my ass. More like I failed to kill him, he commented. Grimjow, you bastard. The one that beat me up was the black woman and the sandal guy, he mumbled. Grimjow scoffed at him, continuing to talk trash at the decima. And I'm saying I would have taken them all out with a single attack, he retorted. Okuyora was the one who spoke up next. Grimjow, do you understand what I'm saying when that boy is of no consequence to us? The orders Aizen Sama gave had nothing to do with his current ability. Rather, it is his growth rate that is truly frightening. There is also a possibility that we could bring him over to our side if the imbalance in his power continues. That is why we did not kill him. And what happens if we can't bring him over to our side, huh? What are you going to do then? Grimjow asked forcefully. Then I will personally deal with him myself. Okuyora finished. Grimjow looked a little taken aback, before he grumbled to himself and sat down. Naruto couldn't help but agree with Grimjow. Okuyora was obviously just trying to remain within Aizen's graces for the time being, but the fact of the matter was that Naruto didn't feel the need to have this Shinigami on his side. Any Shinigami or anything affiliated with the Shinigami was not welcome in his forces, 
and this kid could become a thorn in his side later. Aizen droned on a little longer about trusting Okuyora's judgment, something Naruto didn't really pay attention to in the slightest. In fact, he barely even registered that he had been dismissed. He caught a shock of blue hair disappear out the doorway, before he grinned maniacally, and used Sonido to catch up to the retreating Erencar. Grimjow, stop right there. I know what you plan on doing, he said. Naruto? He questioned, before the blue-haired Erencar scoffed. Don't try to stop me. I'm going to the human world right away to take out that little shit, as well as anyone else that might get in our way. He turned to walk away. Naruto put a hand on his shoulder and grinned. I know. I'm joining you. Later that evening, Grimjaw assembled in the human world with all five of his fraction. The Gargantus closed soundly as they stepped out into the darkness, eager to get into a fight. Shalong, Edrad, Nakim, Yilfort, and Deroy. Most of them were competent Arancars in their own right, and they were some of the oldest Arancar living in Lost No Chase, barring the Priveron and some of the current Espada. They had been with Grimjaw with a long time, even before they had joined the Reino animal. Were you followed? he asked. Of course not. Although, when I came here, I couldn't help but notice some very powerful Ryatsu. Okuyora failed to include them in his report, so they're entirely new threats. Shalong explained. Use your Peskiza. Naruto should be here any SEC now, he said, before his five fraction blanched at the thought of the Primera coming to aid them. Those Shinigami wouldn't know what hit them. The Fraction and the Espada opened up their Pesquisa, sensing the entire town for powerful Ryatsu. Many, many signatures showed up in their radar, far more than what Okuyora had described. There are way more. They might have called into Soul Society and gotten some backup as well. We've got our work cut out for us. Killing them would have been the best course of action, Grimjow said, scratching the back of his head. All of you. Let's go, don't bother distinguishing one Ryatsu from another, and most importantly, don't hold back, he said. As soon as he finished that sentence, another garganta opened in the skies above Karakura town. From the depths of the void, out stopped the blonde Primera himself. His mood and expression were similar to Grimjow's current one, meaning that anything could basically set off his temper at this point. It had been quite some time since he had set foot in the human world and it just never seemed as comfortable as Hueco Mundo did. He glared in front of him, and Grimjow's fraction took the hint immediately. He did not want them anywhere near him for the time being. When he had shushed the fraction to a comfortable distance away, he walked up to Grimjow in midair, the Ryatsa levitation keeping him afloat. The other Espada acknowledged his presence with a quick nod. Have you found them? he asked Grimjow. The Primera Espada clenched his fists before he rubbed his knuckles against his red whisker marks that he had for an astigma. Of course. There are several more than what Okuyora included in his report. We were just about to go kill them all. It doesn't matter if they have even the slightest amount of Ryatsu. We're gonna kill them. Naruto found himself agreeing with Grimjow. He didn't know how many Ryatsus down there were from strong Shinigami, or from just spiritually aware humans. He supposed it didn't really matter though. They were all going to die. It won't do at all if the humans somehow find a way to fight against me. Though, he it looks like a few of them have already found ways to fight against both us and the Shinigami. That orange boy will likely be coming, and he will likely want to fight the strongest opponent here. I assume that you can handle him easily, and I don't need to step in. Naruto asked. Grimjow scoffed. Of course. That weak Shinigami will be no match for me even unreleased. I'll mop him up real quick and get back to business. You don't have to even move a muscle in this fight. Is that so? Well, I'll make sure to watch your men closely, because I'm gonna need as many strong Arankar as possible prepared for this winter. I assume you're game? Naruto asked. Obviously. You know as well as everyone else does that I despise serving Aizen. The question is when do we make our move? He asked, the taller Arankar staring down suspiciously at Naruto. Aizen has just started gaining control of the Hugyoku, and we'll want to wait until it is completely awakened before we make our move. Aizen claims he can make it work before the Winter War, so I assume that is when we'll strike. Until now, keep the operation under wraps. Don't even tell your own fraction. 
Naruto whispered. Grimjow gave a feline grin, his wild face and Turkios markings giving him the perfect visage of a jungle cat. He laughed wildly, the teeth of his Arankar mask moving along with him. But before that, we need to focus on the task at hand, he muttered before he turned to look at his loyal fraction who had given him the moniker of king so long ago. All right, guys. You ready to go get him? He asked rhetorically, as Grimjow's five fraction all took on predatory grins such as the one on their master's face. There are a lot of Shinigami down there, so let's go. I don't want you to let even one of them get away, he shouted, as the fraction rushed into battle. Down in the main part of Karakura town, many Shinigami had their senses go haywire as they sensed the strong Ryatsu coming from the skies. Chapter 38 Queen La Trepidora There was one group of Shinigami sent to protect Karakura town during its time of need. In order to fight the Arankar that would inevitably be sent there by Aizen, they were the most specialized group of anti arankar Shinigami in Seoul society. Supposedly. What actually happened was Aburai Rinji and Kachiki Rukia simply picking people they knew and were close to, creating a hilarious mishmash of personalities and fighting abilities. In addition to Aburai Rinji and Kachiki Rukia, there were five other Shinigami present to bring the total up to seven. Madarem Ikaku and Ayasegawa Yumichika of the 11th Division, 10th Division Vice Captain Matsumoto Ranjuku, 8th Division 3rd Seat Nara Shikamaru, and the newly promoted 5th Division Vice Captain Hataki Kakashi. All of these Shinigami were being led by the 10th Division's Captain, Hitsugaya Tushiru. After a particularly stupid incident where all of these strange Shinigami showed up masquerading as normal high school students, they needed a place to stay afterwards. All seven of them were scattered around a general area, staying with humans that they had managed to hook up a stay with. While they waited for a signal, they simply went along with their daily lives. They ate, they helped out with chores for their hosts, but some of them simply sat on the roof, contemplating the upcoming war and the errand car that they'd be fighting against. While Matsumoto ate, Ikako contemplated an Anajirai, Hitsugaya sat on a roof, and Kakashi, Shikamaru, and Rinji did chores for the Urahara shop, a number of strong riatsas radiated throughout the town. Ichigo's eyes widened as he felt the familiar type of riatsu. Rukia was already on her spirit phone, trying to receive the coordinates of all the signatures, but to no avail. It's them, he thought, thinking back to when he fought those two Arankar the other day. The fight had left a nasty imprint on his behavior, seeing as how he had almost lost control to the thing inside him back then. 2. No 7. There's so many of them. The female Shinigami shouted. Are they headed our way? Ichigo asked frantically. All throughout the town, the assigned Shinigami all shed their jigai to emerge into their real forms. Hitsugaya was the quickest to react, shedding his jigai in a few seconds flat. Matsumoto emerged on the rooftop a few seconds later. Where is Inoue? asked the young captain. She's tired, so she shouldn't interfere with the fight at this rate. I left my jigai there with here though. No. It looks like they're going somewhere, but they aren't headed our way. Rukia paused for a moment, as she noticed a pattern on her phone. They're spreading out in all directions, like they're going for anyone with even the slightest amount of riatsu. No matter how small it is, these Arankar are going to kill them. She finished. Ichigo shed his human body quickly, coming out in his Shinigami form and grabbing the hilt of his Zanpakutu. Ishida should have no spirit power right now, but what about Chad and Inoue? Inoue has Hitsugaya Taisha and Matsumoto Fuku Taisha backing her up. About Chad though, one's heading for him right now. And he doesn't have anyone protecting him. Rukia shouted. Ichigo's eyes widened, and he shot out into the night. Hitsugaya and Matsumoto both stood at the ready within their true, Shinigami bodies, the younger of the two holding the hilt of his Zanpakuta similarly to Ichigo. A flash, and then there were two Arankar standing in midair directly above Inoue Oriheim's rooftop. One was a stout, fat Arankar with a black bowl cut, and a mask covering the complete right half of his face. The other was a taller, skinnier Arankar with a more angular face and braided black hair. His mask covered the upper left portion of his face, with a long spike sticking out of the top of his head to the right. Their names were Shalong Kufang and Akin Green Dina, 
too fraction underneath Grin Zhao's control. Good evening, remarked Shaolong politely, before the fraction used Sonido to get the jump on Hitsugaya. I am the Undecimo Arankar, Shaolong, he greeted, as Hitsugaya blocked his blade. I am the 10th Division Captain, Hitsugaya Tushiru, he retorted. The two broke the contact their blades had made, and stood at a distance between each other. They stared each other down for a good period of time, before they both charged up their riatsu. With Hitsugaya's power limited at 20% percent, it could be a difficult fight. Up in the sky, Naruto watched Shalong and Nakim establish contact with the enemy. He narrowed his eyes as Shalong clashed swords with the captain of all things. He looked at Grinjao, before he said something to the fellow Espada. Go fight whoever the hell you want. But don't do anything stupid. You can introduce yourself, but don't tell anything about the Espada or the fact that I'm planning something. We need things to remain under wraps for the time being. Naruto remarked. Grimjow looked at him oddly. Whatever. I don't care about that anyway, he said. Good, I'll leave them to you then. I've got something to take care of, so I won't be able to join the fight just yet. No one here should be a match for you anyway, Naruto said. Before Grimjow could respond to him, Naruto had flashed away. With one simple burst of sonido, he landed on Inoue's balcony and concealed his presence, in a safe place where he could watch Hitsugaya's and Shalong's battle. Meanwhile, Chad rushed through the lower part of town, eager to join in battle and help out. His breath caught in his throat as a hand shot out and almost impaled him straight through the heart. It would have too, if another hand didn't grab it before it could do any damage. My oh my. That was a little dangerous there, don't you think? Asked a smooth male voice as he gripped the attacking Arankar's hand tightly, preventing him from pulling it back. A masked Shinigami stood in front of Chad, putting himself between the human and the Arankar. Chad's eyes widened and he clutched the area over his heart where blood began to leak. Chad, why don't you let us handle this? Came a lazy voice standing on the fence nearby them. Chad looked up to see a Shinigami with a pineapple hairstyle crouched on the fence, his bored expression at odds with the events that were happening. Chad let his emotionally heightened state relax into his normal, calm one, and he nodded thoughtfully. Oh, I get it. I'll just leave it to you, then, he said, after a little bit of suppressed protesting. The large teenager ran away at a brisk pace, not even pausing as Rukia and Ichigo called out to him. Kakashi, Shikamura-san. Ichigo called out, as he and Rukia ran up to them. He witnessed the Arankar with the strange mask and the bandage over his right eye, and he grasped the hilt of his Zanpakutu. Save it, Kurosaki. Let Kakashi handle this one. He hasn't had any serious action in quite some time. It'll be fine. Kakashi won't lose, said Shikamaru, as he fiddled with his own Zanpakutu while Kakashi drew his. It was a normal katana with a gray hilt and a pretty standard guard. Despite that, Kakashi wielded it with absolute ease. The Arankar he was facing grinned deviously, giving him a crooked smile. The Arankar rushed forward, and Kakashi blocked his attack with his Zanpakutu. The vice-captain slashed vertically, catching the Arankar's hand which managed to block it with Hiero. I'm Arankar Diocisius Diroi, he introduced. Kakashi was about to introduce himself at the 5th Division's vice-captain, but Deroy cut him off before he could finish. Yeah, save it. If I learned the name of everyone I was going to kill, then I'd never be able to remember any of them. Kakashi glared at the 16th Arankar, though he didn't say a single word to his adversary. Kakashi's sword and Deroy's arm continued to push for dominance in their stalemate, but Kakashi began to push even harder. Deroy gasped as the Zanpakutu broke through his hiero. Blood began to spurt from the wound he was receiving, before the sword sliced clean through the arm, severing it and creating little more than a stump. The arm flopped bloodily on the ground, while Deroy screamed in pain and clutched his bleeding stump with his remaining arm. Kakashi withdrew his blade and readied himself for another attack. One shunpa later, and Deroy was outmatched. Kakashi's speed was far too much for the deformed Arankar, and he was speared on the end of Kakashi's sword before he could even recover from the last injury he had gotten. Didam Wayu. Deroy choked out as Kakashi pulled his blade out of the Arankar's body, a fountain of blood splashing all over the place. 
Deroy's vision began to get muddy, and he tried to lift his arms so he could grab Kakashi. But to no avail, the wound was far too deep, and the sixteenth Arankar collapsed to his knees, trying to stop the blood with his hands. One moment later, and Deroy was dissolving into dust. It's such a shame that you didn't allow me to finish my introduction, Kakashi said coolly, as he sheathed his Zanpakutu. Shikamaru yawned up on the wall, while Ichigo and Rukia looked at Kakashi and all. He's as strong as ever, Rukia remarked. Ichigo nodded right beside her. Kakashi sighed and adjusted his mask a little, before he turned to face his three compatriots. Kurosaki-san, Kachiki-san, Shikamaru, are you? He was cut off as a horribly strong Ryatsu fell over the area. Kakashi turned around frantically, his eyes wide, while Shikamaru, Rukia, and Ichigo stood rooted in shock, their eyes focused on something ahead. What's this Ryatsu? I'm gonna have to release the limit if I want to fight this, Kakashi said frantically in his head. What? I suppose Deroy got beaten after all, huh? Were you guys the ones that did it? Came a rough, raspy voice from over the rooftop a ways away. A black sandal stepped on one of the panes, and Grimjow stepped off of the roof and into the light in front of the four Shinigami. They stood there petrified, unable to comprehend that the Arankar in front of him was the same species as the one before. I'm Arankar Siete. Grimjow. Nice to meet ya, Shinigami, he hissed. So, it looks like Deroy got fucking killed, huh? Never was much of a good fighter anyway, so whatever. Naruto remarked as he lounged on the balcony. So far he had been watching Shalong and Nakim's fights intently. They were doing pretty well thus far, though granted the limiters were probably on right now anyway. His eyes widened again. So, they got it right too? Fucking useless piece of shit. He cursed under his breath. It looked like Heelford had released for some reason, but he wasn't too interested in that fight. He could everything they were saying up there, and it looked like Nakim and Shaolong had the upper hand currently, even after Hitsugaya went into Bankai. Oh my god, this kid sucks. Naruto remarked, watching the young captain sever his icy Bankai tail in an attempt to kill Shaolong. Not to mention, the flower petals that made up the timer for his Bankai were dwindling down. Even at only 20% power, it was pathetic. Even with your abysmal combat abilities, it would just be too rude to fight a captain without my strongest battle capabilities. That's why, before your Bankai disappears, I will exterminate you with them. Shalong held his sword in front of him, and placed his fingers on the guard as if he was going to scratch it. He spread his palms out after that as his sword began to glow with yellow Riatsu. Snip, Tijerita, he shouted, as he was engulfed in a pillar of his own Riatsu. When the Ryatsu cloud dispersed, Shalom was standing there in his full resurrection. His caged mask covered the left half of his face, and his hollow mask armor covered much of his torso and all of his arms. An insect-like tail emerged from his backside, and his hands became deadly-looking pincer blades that could slice through an enemy with ease. Shalom smirked, as before Hitsugaya could even react, he was gored through on Shalom's pincers which left five deep slashes alongside the captain's body. He gurgled up blood and coughed it, and Shalong introduced his full name. Undecimo Arankar, Shalong Tsufang. It's been a pleasure knowing you, little Captain San, he said, as he sliced off a part of Hitsugaya's wings with his claws. Hitsugaya stared down at his wounds in shock, trying to comprehend how this Arankar was able to wound him so much. He was about to plummet to earth, but he held his ground, planting his levitating feet in midair and panting, still prepared for battle. Amazing, you still stand in front of me even after being confronted with my strength. As expected of a captain. It's admirable, really. Shalong commented. Hitsugaya only scoffed at him. Shalong Tsufang. I want to ask you something. You said that you were the Undecimo Arankar, so in other words you're the eleventh one. That means you're the eleventh best in terms of combat ability, right? Shalong looked contemplative. No. The numbers we are given do not reflect our strength, but rather the order in which we were born. However, Shalong trailed off, and Hitsugaya looked quizzical. That only applies to Arankar numbered eleventh and below. Naruto's eyes snapped open, 
and he narrowed his eyes at Shalom from below on the balcony. Shall I explain? First, using the Higyoku, we were transformed from hollows into Arankar, which consolidates our birth. Even though there are many hollow that have arankarized without the Higyoku, we are given a number starting from eleven and going downwards. The Arankar with particularly strong combat abilities and plucked out and given a number from one to ten, from strongest to weakest. Fuck, you're saying too much now. Naruto seethed, as he gripped the rail of the balcony. After a split-second decision, he released himself from the rail and stood rigid. He thrust his hand out in front of him, which charged with a display of orange. Bala Sigendo, he muttered, as he launched a bullet of orange off into the night. It flew straight for a moment before it curved towards its intended target. Those chosen ten are called the Espada. They have their particular numbers tattooed somewhere on their bodies as proof. They are also given authority over all Arankar ranked eleven and below. He trailed off, as a lazy smirk entered his face. And let me make this perfectly clear. Compared to Arankar like us, the strength of the Espada is in a whole other dimension. Hitsugaya's eyes widened in shock. I'll say one last thing. Among this group of Arankar that entered the real world, there he was cut off and as orange Bala slammed into the side of his head. He yelled as the energy seared into his skin, before the Bala burst into an uncharacteristic surge of power. When the energy had cleared, Shalong's head was missing. The headless Arankar then fell to the ground dead, his speech to Hitsugaya forever remaining unfinished. Fucking dumbass. I was too late. He already said too damn much, Naruto remarked, his Ryatsu still finished. He sighed in anger in order to prevent lashing out, before he disappeared in Sonido back to the spot where the Garganta had opened. Looks like Grimjow's about to fight. I'll have to tell him the newest development. I'm sure he won't mind being down one more fraction. If the remaining two can't pull out a victory, he'll be riding solo from now on. Tai Cho. Matsumoto shouted, as her captain hung in the air. Hitsugaya shook himself from his daze, remembering that there were still more opponents to be fought. We still haven't heard the signal to lift the limit yet, he shouted. Matsumoto lay defeated at the ground at the hands of Nikim, who looked about ready to crush her. She was about to shake her head before her communicator buzzed with a sound. A voice was heard on the other side, and Matsumoto communicated with the 12th Division member on the other side. Tai Cho. Rinji. Kakashi. We've been cleared to life the limit, she shouted into her communicator. It's about damn time, Rinji shouted excitedly, as he unbuttoned the hem of his robe to show the 6th Division symbol on the inside. Over on the other side of the battlefield, Kakashi wasn't so excited. Even with the limit released, it might not be enough. Even Shikamura had witnessed the danger that Grimjow was, as he had drawn his sword and was readying himself. Kakashi, Rinji, and Ranjiku all braced themselves for the limit release. Limit. Release. They shouted. Hmm, it looks like they released the limit. Oh, well, it looks like Grimjow isn't going to have any fraction after this. Naruto remarked, feeling the riatsu of the new and improved Shinigami. So? Grimjow asked, as he stared down the four Shinigami. The unranked, the substitute, the third seat, and the vice captain. All of them were staring intently at Grimjow like they would a wild animal. They needed to attack tentatively. I'm asking which one of you is strongest? He asked, as he panned his eyes through the row of Shinigami. Rukia gasped, before she turned to the other three. Everyone, this is bad. Get out of here! She shouted. She didn't have any time to react as Grimjow thrust his fist directly through her chest, punching a hole in it completely. Yeah, I thought it wasn't you, he remarked. He pulled his hand out and let her flop to the ground awkwardly, like nothing had happened. Rukia! Ichigo shouted as he rushed Grimjow. Kakashi and Shikamaru stared wide-eyed as they watched their comrade get impaled, only to be brought out of their spell by Ichigo's bold move. Kurosaki! Don't Shikamaru shouted before Grimjow flashed into existence before him. With the same tactic, and with speed that Shikamaru couldn't even react to, he was impaled in the exact same way as Rukia. Shikamaru! Damn it! Kakashi cursed, as he took a swipe at Grimjow. 
He grunted in surprise as Grimjow caught the seal blade in his bare hand, holding it as if it wasn't even sharp. He crushed the sword in his fist, breaking it directly in half before throwing the blade away. Kakashi recoiled in surprise at the power of the Aspada, before a kick to the stomach from Grimjow sent him groggy. Kakashi flew into the wall behind him, and lay there still. Kakashi-san, Shikamaru-san, Ichigo cried. The whole incident lasted no more than ten seconds, and now Ichigo was the only one left who was battle-ready. Ichigo swung his giant butcher for a shirkai at Grimjow, who blocked it easily with his elbow. The orange-haired Shinigami attempted to fire off against Suga, but it ended up backfiring into his direction instead. Grimjow held his arm up, looking bored at Ichigo's display. Hey, stop fucking around, Shinigami. I'm going easy on you right now so you can get your bankai out. If you don't, then I'll rip a hole in you just like I did that Shinigami over there. He shouted with a lunatic grin. Bastard. He roared before he stared at his fallen comrades and the enemy in front of him. He didn't have a choice. Bankai. Ichigo shouted as he was covered with a black and red riatsu, his body beginning to accommodate to the change. Is that it? Ichigo didn't respond choosing instead to stab his black bankai sword into the ground, creating a crater in the street. Grimjow hopped out of the way of the strike, readying himself as Ichigo swiped at Grimjow from down below. The Septima grabbed Tensa Zangetsu in his hand, in the same manner as he did with Kakashi. He then lurched Ichigo and threw him. The orange-haired Shinigami skidded down the street and tried to level himself, but in the end he was a couple blocks away when he had stopped. Grimjow sonidoed right in front of him, and tried to catch him with a nasty left hook. The Shinigami in turn shunpit away and horizontally slashed at Grimjow. He was thwarted by Hiero yet again, and got a kick to the face for his troubles. Grimjow then kicked the boy downwards, so that Ichigo crashed into the street due to the force. Grimjow sped down to the street where Ichigo lay, casually kicking him to the curb. While Ichigo was still downed, Grimjow grabbed his collar and proceeded to punch the living daylights out of Ichigo for at least a few minutes straight. He kicked Ichigo up, and then down again before spitting into the street from midair. Is that all there is to a bankai? Grimjow mused, before a figure flashed into existence right beside him. A shock of blonde hair covered by fox ear masks gave the identity away. Wow, that was it. You're done already? Naruto asked smirking down at the beaten Shinigami in the street. Grimjow looked to the side at him, before smiling like a lunatic. This kid ain't worth shit. I don't know why Aizen threw a shifit over him. Grimjow commented. Getsuga. Tens ho. The two Erenkar looked down where Ichigo lay in the street, where he had charged up a powerful Ryatsu attack. The red and black wave of Ryrioka flew toward both Espada. Naruto flashed away on reflex. Grimjow was unprepared for it. He shielded his arms in front of his face, and in the end he received little more than a few minor injuries. What? Alquiora didn't mention anything like that attack, Shinigami. Grimjow hissed as he grinned down at the young Shinigami. Ichigo was muttering something underneath his breath that neither Naruto nor Grimjow could pick up on. Am I still disappointing you? Erenkar, Ichigo retorted. Naruto reappeared next to Grimjow in a burst of sonido, and Ichigo took notice of his presence for the first time. Who the hell are you? He asked rudely, angry over the arrival of yet another Erenkar. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the injured boy, thinking he was probably an idiot for provoking him when he was already so injured. Grimjow, why don't you go ahead and finish him off? You've already done most of the work, and this kid is beginning to piss me off. It'll be a reprieve when he's finally dead. Ha! Huh. Well, isn't this great, Shinigami? It seems there's finally a reason to kill you! Grimjow roared. He placed a hand on the hilt of his Zampakutu, drawing it forward slowly as if to draw out the tension. Don't just stand there spacing out, Shinigami. It's my turn now. His Zampakutu was almost out of his sheath when another presence flashed itself behind Grimjow. Naruto's eyes narrowed, having picked up on it the second he had arrived into the real world. That fucker Tosin was here to take them back to Hueco Mundo. Sheath your sword, Grimjow. Tosin said calmly, as he managed to get the jump on Grimjow. 
Grimjow's eyes widened, and he grunted as he felt the familiar presence. Tosin! He sheathed his sword. Why the hell are you here? He asked forcefully. Naruto glared at the ex-captain, knowing full well why he was here. He didn't say anything, though. Do you really not understand why I'm here? He asked. You two take it upon yourselves to invade the human world, mobilize five Arankar, and then lose them in battle. It was all against orders. You understand, right? Aizen-sama is furious. Grimjow. Naruto. We're going. Your punishment will be decided in Hueco Mundo, both of you. Tosin finished, as he opened up a garganta to take them back to Hueco Mundo. This time it was Naruto who spoke up. Now, wait just a minute here. Aizen obviously sent you to bring us back, possibly by force. Just what makes you think you can tell me to do anything, huh? Do you want a repeat of what happened last time, where I wiped that pretty little sense of justice of yours on my boot? Naruto goaded, getting as close to Tosin's face as possible. You bastard. Tosin muttered, cold anger creeping into his voice. But whatever. I'll go back to Hueco Mundo and take this so-called punishment of yours. Of course, it's not like Aizen's actually going to do anything now, is he? Naruto said, as he walked into the Garganta ahead of Tosin. Tosin glared for a few seconds longer, before he regained his peace and stepped into the Garganta. Grimjow followed behind him. Wait. Where are you going? Ichigo shouted up towards the blue-haired Arankar. Shut the fuck up already. I'm going back to Hueco Mundo. Stop fucking with me. You come here and attack, and think you can just leave when you feel like it? Stop joking around, and get your ass back here. Our fight isn't over yet. You shut the fuck up. Me leaving is the only reason you're still alive right now. That technique you have hurts you, and I know you could only get two or three more shots with that thing. And even then you're still no match for me. Don't forget my name, and pray that you don't hear it a second time. Because if you do, you're dead meat. Ichigo stared and stared, thinking of nothing he could say to the Espada. Grimjow grinned psychotically, and bore a close resemblance to a jungle cat with that grin. Grimjow Jigger Jacks Back in Hueco Mundo, Grimjow and Naruto walked through the Hall of Lost Nochase towards the throne room, where they would apparently receive their punishment for their actions. You really went wild back there in the real world. You even told them your name, though I assume you didn't give any information away about the Espada. Naruto said. Grimjow said nothing in return. By the way, we ran into a little bit of a difficulty in our trip to the human world. One of your fraction decided to blab important information about the Espada and what we are. So Soul Society knows about our little group by now, even if they have no specific information about individual members. Despite that, I had to put Shalong down before he said something important. Naruto said. There was no hint of an apology in his voice at all. Whatever, I don't care. Just tell me when you're ready to move out, and I'll do my part from that point on. Grimjow replied. I'm looking forward to it. Naruto remarked, as he opened the double doors to the throne room. Aizen was of course sitting on his throne in the center, and Tosin was off to the right. Jin was nowhere to be seen. Ever since the three captains had defected from Soul Society, they had undergone several appearance changes. Aizen for one slicked back his hair and ditched the glasses, and Tosin let his braids out. The two Arankar walked up to the throne, either of them bowing or getting on their knees. Tosin however did bow in respect for his leader, before he turned to both rebellious Arankar. Welcome back. Naruto, Grimjow, Aizen said calmly, a small smile on his face. Well, do you two think you should be saying sorry for something? Tosin asked the two Arankar. Not really slash fuck you, said Grimjow and Naruto respectively. Naruto in particular didn't even bother looking at Tosin before cursing him out like that. You bastards. Tosin began. It's fine, can aim. Aizen's voice rang out before them. I'm not even the least bit upset, because after all, one with such a fiery spirit would take responsibility for one's own actions. Am I mistaken, Grimjow? Naruto? Aizen asked. You are, Grimjow said. Naruto didn't say anything. That tore it for Tosin, 
He grabbed the collar of Grin Zhao's Erencar vest and pulled tightly, glaring at the Erencar. Aizen-sama, please give me permission to execute these two, he shouted. The way I see it, you just hate me, don't you, Tosin? From day one, you couldn't stand me, Grim Zhao muttered, a smirk on his face. Naruto allowed himself a small laugh at Tosin's sake. I have no tolerance for those who seek to cause chaos. For Aizen-sama's sake, that's all there is to it, Tosin responded. Grim Zhao shook his head. You never missed the chance to bring up your moral, righteous bullshit, he mocked. Yes, moral justice. Something that your behavior is highly lacking in, for justice without morals is the same as senseless murder. However, murder in the name of moral justice is... Tosin trailed off, as he drew his sword. Righteous, he said as he lopped off Grimjow's left arm. He went for Naruto's directly after that, only to be halted completely by Naruto's hiero. Tosin balked as his sword failed to get through the defense, and Naruto stared at him ruthlessly. The only thing that happened was that Naruto's robe had gotten scuffed. Tosin, you are the biggest fucking hypocrite to ever walk this desert. Do you realize how much everyone tires of your endless justice preaching crap? Because they do. Honestly, in this line of work you'd be more suited being as wantonly destructive as me or Grimjow. But instead you spout out all this nonsense about how murder is righteous and justice this and justice that. It's not righteous. And if you honestly believe that anything we're doing is righteous, then you're delusional. There is no justice here, so your attitude makes me sick. When you enter Waco Mundo, you leave all that bullshit at the fucking door. I knew a hollow like you before. His name was Furimos. I killed him, and the only thing that's stopping me from killing you is Aizen Sama. And that's another thing, you fucking piece of shit lapdog. Your bitch-ass morals have been used by Aizen and whoever for who knows how long because you're gullible enough to believe that they're leading you towards a world of justice and righteousness. All the while you talk about killing for the sake of a greater justice that everyone here is working hard to prevent. Suck my cock. Naruto patted down his arm, before he shoved Tosin off of him. The former captain recovered instantly, focusing his attention on Grimjow's severed arm. Had a number 54, Heian he cried, as a blaze of purple fire incinerated Grim Zhao's arm so it could never be reattached to him. Naruto scowled, Grim Zhao was going to get demoted after that. Afterwards, Tosin fixed him with a glare that said I'll remember this. Grim Zhao meanwhile stormed out of the throne room, his mood turning sour since he had gotten his arm chopped off. Naruto looked up at Aizen, who was profoundly neutral to the whole thing. His speech towards Tosin had been a largely bold move, but Aizen didn't seem to mind. When his boss said nothing to him, he turned his back to Tosin and Aizen and walked out behind Grimjow. He had some new business to take care of. Later that evening, Naruto stood out in front of a very particular door and lost no chase. There were sounds of whirring and drilling going on in the inside, but these sounds were only made every once in a while, when an espada happened to die or get demoted. He stood out in front of the door, not even bothering to hide his riatsu or hide in the shadows. The door slammed open forcefully as a short androgynous-looking Erencar stepped out the door, his sleeves flapping in a very flamboyant-looking manner. He walked with a strut, and a smug grin was perched on his face. His Erencar uniform currently wasn't showing his right hip, where the number seven had recently gotten tattooed there, showing that he was Grimjow's replacement into the Espada. It didn't take long for him to notice Naruto standing right there. Hmm. What are you doing here, Naruto? Come to lament your punishment. I know you've getting demoted too after you resisted Tosin-san. You better run along now. You don't want to be seen disobeying an espada as well. Is this idiot stupid? Why the fuck does Luppy think I'm getting demoted? Aizen doesn't give a shit about what I said to Tosin or how I acted in the human world. I'm still the damn Primera. Despite the fact that his thoughts were sound, Naruto didn't say anything to Luppy despite his tirade. The new Espada took it as a sign of respect, and he held his head up high before he walked right past Naruto. He turned back around when he heard a Zanpaka to become unsheathed. He saw the gleam of the metal as Naruto contemplated his move, before Naruto put his Zanpaka to back into its sheath. He glared at the Primera. What do you think you're doing, Naruto? He asked angrily a hand on his own Zanpakutu. 
Naruto had his back to the new Septima, before he turned around to show Luppy an animalistic grin. Luppy couldn't even react before he was impaled through the chest by Naruto's hand, blood pouring the wound as he lost the grip on his sheath Zanpakutu. Despite that, the Espada stopped himself from falling to one knee. Naruto laughed loudly, his euphoria stimulated by the thrill of the murder. Sorry, Luppy. I won't accept anyone other than Grimjow than the Septima Espada, so I'm afraid you're gonna have to take a little old dirt nap now. It's been nice knowing you during your service as an Espada, he shouted, as he charged up an orange Ciro. He grabbed the wounded Luppy's collar, the Ciro now at point-blank range. Luppy whimpered as his eyes widened, and he looked for any possible way to escape the situation. The Ciro was beginning to look a little bit big for his tastes. Naruto sighed in pleasure, as fired the Ciro. Luppy screamed in agony as the entire top half of his body was obliterated by Naruto's blast, leaving a set of white-clothed legs where Luppy once was. Septima Espada Mayas? Naruto remarked, thinking about how easily Luppy went down. Even if they were six ranks apart, that display right there was simply pathetic beyond all measure. He gets into a bad situation and completely loses it. It makes sense, though. There aren't really that many Arankar and Lost No Chase who can fill even the lowest Espada position, let alone the Septima. Luppy was probably the best Aizen had, and any future ones will likely be even weaker. Naruto walked away after dragging the remainder of Luppy's body away from the hallway. He would dispose of the corpse later. There were things to be done to prepare for the rebellion. He and Sale had made a breakthrough when it came to Aizen Shirkai and now they just had to wait until they secured a stable path to soul society. Chapter 39, El Arankar Desconocido Kurosaki Ichigo's consciousness was a very, very fragile thing to behold. While at certain times it seemed like his willpower couldn't be beaten by anyone, especially when it came to his friends, there was actually a much deeper facet to his personality than that. When Ichigo lost, it was customary for him to fall into a deep depression. This time he had lost twice in a short period of time, and it didn't help that he had an inner hollow constantly breathing down his neck. He was draped across his bed, unmoving with his eyes so lidded they looked like they were closed. He moaned and groaned every once in a while, but otherwise didn't say anything. His family, Rukia, and Khan had all left him alone for the time being, so he was laying there alone, staring at his ceiling lamp. His bandaged body ached tremendously but he didn't give that any thought at all. All he was thinking about was how weak he was, how he had failed to protect his friends and his town from the Arankar. He vaguely noticed someone opening the window from the outside, but he didn't even care. The hollow in him was acting up again. He could feel his cold presence edging ever closer to him, and the damnable grin on his face ever present. It was going to devour him and his personality, and there wasn't a thing he could do about it. Whoa, you really let that last fight mess you up, came a smooth voice from outside the window. Ichigo didn't even register the voice, considering his inner hollow was speaking to him about something. His hollow's voice was coming out as a garbled blur. No words were understandable. Leave him alone, Hataki. We're not here to comment on his condition, but rather to give him the report, came a second voice, which seemed to hold far more authority than the voice that was apparently Kakashi's. Yes, Hitsugai Taishu, he said, as the young, white-haired captain emerged onto the windowsill right next to Kakashi. Ichigo took note of them for the first time by looking their way. Tushiru. Kakashi-san, he muttered, his voice cracked with hopelessness and depression. Kakashi's sweat dropped. The gloom was beginning to rub off on him, and he could practically taste it in the air. Well, putting your depression aside for now, there are a few things that we need to talk to you about first. Would you care to explain it to him, Hitsugaya Taisha? Yeah. Hitsugaya muttered before he looked down at his arms which were resting on his lap. Gigas were so cumbersome. The Arankar are far more powerful than we could have ever anticipated. The group that we fought the other night, there were only Jillian and a Juchus class Arankar in that. No Vasto Lord. If a simple Jillian became that much more powerful through becoming an Arankar then I don't know what we're going to do. The captain trailed off, and noticed that Ichigo was at least listening to them now. All five of the Arankar that we fought were killed, some in more, interesting ways. 
However, the one that you and Hataki were fighting returned to Hueco Mundo alive, and it seemed to be the strongest of the bunch. Hataki said that the Arankar's name was Grimjow, and that he was Arankar Siete, or Seven. We would like to know if you received any information on him, or his abilities. Honestly, I don't even know if you could call what I did a fight. I was so easily defeated that it was humiliating, and I didn't even get any information on him besides his name. Kakashi commented. He rubbed a spot on his abdomen where Grimjow had nearly killed him. That seemed to be the wrong thing to say, as Ichigo slumped back down into another depression. He didn't speak to either of them for so long that Kakashi almost spoke up. Despite that, he finally answered before Kakashi managed to get something out. Grimjow. Jiger Jax. That was his full name. Ichigo said glumly, before he scratched the back of his hand. To be honest, I don't know. He defeated me so easily that I didn't gain any knowledge on his abilities or anything like that. He was a blue-haired Arankar with an open vest, but Kakashi can tell you that. Other than that I know he fights with really strong Hakuda. I see, Hitsugaya muttered, apparently disappointed. That only strengthens the evidence, he remarked. Ichigo and Kakashi looked at him quizzically. What do you mean, Hitsugaya Taishu? Kakashi asked. What I mean is that this entire war may cost us more casualties than we realize. During my fight with an Arankar named Shaolong Tsufang, I was led on to some very important information. Within Aizen's Arankar forces, there are multiple ranks in the system. The ones that myself, Matsumoto, Aburai, and Madaraim fought were all ones called Numeros. They have numbers from eleven downwards. The Arankar that you two fought, this Grimjow, is most likely among the Espada rank. Espada. They are the ten strongest Arankar within Aizen's forces, ranked one to ten based on how strong or weak they are. Grimjow Jigerjax holds the rank of Siete meaning that he is the seventh Espada. And given how easily you two were defeated by him, these Espada are strong. That is why I wanted to get as much information on that Espada as possible. We need to be prepared for them, but unfortunately we have a startling lack of information on who they are or what their abilities are. I see. You were relying on me to get that information. Ichigo trailed off. The depression was back in full force, and Kakashi's sweat dropped again. He himself had been beaten far easier than Ichigo, but he wasn't moping around like this. Hitsugaya sighed. Don't worry about it, it's just one part of this entire war. We have ten of those guys to look out for, after all, not to mention the three renegade captains from Soul Society. Hitsugaya said, as he jumped out of the window. Before he managed to do so, Ichigo interrupted him. Wait, Tushiru. There was a second Arankar there with Grimjow after I had been defeated, and I know for a fact it wasn't any of the Arankar you fought. Hitsugaya halted and Kakashi raised an eyebrow. Care to explain? The masked Shinigami said. Ichigo closed his eyes and sighed, trying to remember the events of the previous night. It isn't much. I didn't see him until one of the rogue captains came here to drag them back to Hueco Mundo. From my standpoint, I couldn't hear anything that he said and his appearance was such a blur, he trailed off, the face becoming no clearer in his head. Short size, blonde hair, that's all I remember about that Arankar. He suppressed his Ryatsu extraordinarily well, and he seemed keen on hiding his face from me. Hitsugaya mulled over that for a moment, trying to reach a suitable conclusion on the mysterious Arankar that Ichigo had encountered after fighting Grimjow. Another Espada? No, it's too early to assume that. For all we know, that Arankar could simply be another subordinate of Jigerjax that decided not to join the battle, he said out loud, as Kakashi and Ichigo thought over it as well. A very mysterious Arankar, and unfortunately there is no real way to procure any more information on it, Hitsugaya said before he jumped out of Ichigo's window, apparently done talking. We'll make sure to let you know if anything else important comes up. Kakashi added as an afterthought before he too jumped out of the window to leave Ichigo to his own devices. Ichigo laid there in his best for a few more hours easily, but instead of his thoughts being plagued by depression, they were plagued by uncertainty and confusion. He grit his teeth and resisted the urge to punch the wall. After that, he rose to his feet and put on a jacket after grabbing his substitute Shinigami badge.
He had visors to find. The orange-haired substitute Shinigami stood outside an old, abandoned warehouse, looking at it with distaste. So, they lived here, they didn't even have a shred of class. But it was bizarre, there was something about this building that stood out. Everything was avoiding it. The birds, the cats, and even the ants didn't even notice it was there. He walked into the warehouse, seeing a multitude of figures standing around at various places. Shinji, the de facto leader of the group, was hovering in midair in front of him. He had been the one to talk to Ichigo these past few weeks, and Ichigo had never actually met any of the other visored besides one. So, it seems you've finally found our hiding place, said Shinji, as all nine visors stood in the rafters or on top of boxes. It was a varied ragtag group of misfits. That look on your face. It looks like you've been searching for us all day, haven't you? We tried to make it as easy as possible to find us so even you could locate this place, but I guess it wasn't enough. But whatever. I guess you're determined to become one of us now, right? Hell no! Ichigo shouted at the top of his lungs, making Shinji balk and back up a little bit. Ichigo looked around, there seemed to be nine visored in total. Me, become one of you guys? You've gotta be kidding me, the only thing I wanna do with you guys, is use you. I won't join up with you guys, but I'm sure that you can teach me how to quiet down the hollow that's inside of me, Ichigo explained. All nine of the visored were looking a little annoyed by now, all except for an old man off to the side who wore a calm expression. Well, look at you talking big. And what makes you think we're just gonna do that? Shinji challenged. Ichigo didn't look even the slightest bit perturbed, but his head was hung dangerously low. I'll just force you to do it then he said, as he pulled out his substitute Shinigami badge and placed it over his chest. He left his body easily and grabbed his butcher knife Sanpakutu, flashing towards Shinji. Oh man, you're a crazy one all right, he muttered. Shinji's Sanpakutu laid over to the side, before he kicked it up with his foot, ready to block Ichigo. Wait. Shinji-kun, came a voice. Ichigo stopped his assault to notice that he had been blocked by the old man that had been sitting off to the side away from everyone else. I'll stop him, he said. He was a strong old man, despite the fact that he body would suggest otherwise. He was a relatively short old man, and was dressed in just about what one would expect from someone in his advanced age. Though he was wearing this strange hat that wouldn't be out of place in the Edo period of Japan's history. Saratobi Hiruzen, a pleasure to meet you, he said, after he had pulled his Zanpakutu out of its sheath, and flashed towards the boy, blocking Ichigo's Zanpakutu easily. One month later. Within Las Noches, Aizen was watching a very peculiar display on a hologram in front of his throne. The orange-haired girl, in no way Oriheim's power was incredibly interesting. Yami completely obliterated that human boy's arm, and Oriheim had managed to heal it like it was nothing. No, not healing. Healing was an incredibly generic power, and Captain Unohana could easily do that. This was a completely different kind of power. Her power wasn't healing. What is your power, girl? Aizen mused, as on the screen the strange power expanding to cover a wider area. Within the Lost No Chase archives, Naruto was watching the same display on the main monitor. The human boy with the messed up arm was healed completely by the girl, even though by all means he should be permanently without an arm. Well, this is one interesting power, and I think I can make use of this, he said, thinking back to how Grim Zhao's arm was completely destroyed by Tosin. Yami was getting his lost arm reattached at the moment, but with Grim Zhao there was nothing to reattach. Naruto wouldn't accept anyone but him at the rank, and if he couldn't heal that arm he would be without a septima in the end. Was Aizen trying to slow him down or something? Alcora had already told him that Aizen planned to kidnap that girl anyway for some reason. The Higyoku deteriorated if he used it too much, so they needed to repair. It was probably the biggest load of crap Naruto had ever heard in his life. He shut down the monitor. The operation to capture that girl was soon. He had hoped that he would get to be the one to go capture her, but this was more Okuyora's forte. He could manipulate her into thinking that she had to come with them. Naruto would probably just scare her off, or he would just kill her right there. Whatever, Aizen was creating a very special errand card today, so he couldn't dwell on it for long. 
He rose from the ornate chair he was sitting in and exited the building. The Hugyoka's chamber was right next to the archive, so he didn't have long before he reached there. He opened the big double doors and noticed that pretty much everyone was there already. The Espada were being called to witness the birth of a brand new errand car that was apparently essential to their victory. So you came. Naruto, Aizen said from the center of the room, where he was standing over a bandaged figure contained in a glass box. The hollow's arms and legs were apparently bound by Kidu, and Aizen was holding up the Hugyoku. How's the damned Hugyoku? He asked. Aizen smiled. Fifty percent. Right on schedule, according to Soul Society, that is. Of course, there is no way to directly understand unless you're the one holding the Hugyoku. The Hugyoku was sealed away right after its development, so not even Yurihara Kisuk could know about this. That by temporarily fusing with one who has at least twice the Ryatsu of a Captain-class Shinigami, it will instantaneously have the same level of power as the fully awakened Hugyoku. The area began to glow with a yellow light, and the glass box containing the bandaged hollow shattered into pieces and scattered throughout the area. Can you tell us your name, comrade? Kneeling in the middle where the box once was, was a blonde childlike Erenkar with a dopey-looking face. He was completely nude, allowing the hollow hole on his sternum to be revealing. His mask fragment was a tiara-like piece on his forehead. He had purple eyes and freckles, as well as a viciously bad snaggletooth that poked out from his mouth. His zanpakutu, which lay at his side, was an Egyptian-style sword that was about half the size of his own body. All in all, he looked bizarre. Wonderweiss. Wonderweiss Margila, he said. His voice literally sounded like a mentally retarded child. Naruto whistled. Aizen really did a number on this one, taking all his intelligence, perceptions, and memories, and creating an errand car who was effectively an autistic child. All just to counter Yamamoto Genryosai Shigakuni's Zanpakutu, according to the files. He chuckled, making a few other Espada look at him in confusion. I am just getting weapons of all kinds today. Okuyora, you remember the orders I gave you already, correct? Aizen said, cutting Naruto out of his thoughts. The melancholic Kinta Espada hopped off his perch in the back of the room, walking up to the center of the room next to Wonder Weiss. Okuyora then closed his eyes and looked pensive. Of course. Execute them. I'm giving you the power to make the command. You may take anyone you like. Aizen said. Understood. Oh, that's right. Why don't you come along, Grimjow? Aizen remarked, before he turned around to see the former Espada sitting on the highest ledge of the room. Grimjow scowled. Naruto frowned. He definitely wasn't going to go on this mission if he could help it. He had already seen enough of the real world for the time being, and they could definitely handle it on their own. Not to mention the fact that they had negation on standby should anything go wrong. Still, he wanted to fight that Kurosaki kid for himself. Grimjow and Yami had apparently gotten a shot at him. He wanted his turn. He debated with himself for a final moment, before he reached a conclusion. I'm going with you guys. I've been bored lately, so I'll meet you all when we open the Garganta. Naruto mumbled to Aizen, who smirked at him as he left the room. Okuyora, Grimjow, Yami, and Wonder Weiss all gathered in the center of the room ready to discuss the details of the mission. Three hours later, and they found Naruto standing outside the gate to the interior of Las Noches. He was looking down at the sands below, apparently reminiscing over his time as a regular hollow. So, I take it we're about to get going, he commented, looking over the four other Erenkar that had arrived. Three Espada, one former Espada, and an Erenkar that apparently had the Ryatsu of an Espada. It was a solid team, one that should definitely be a big enough threat to flush in no way Oriheim out of hiding. Of course, Alquiora wouldn't be fighting, though. He would be off on his own, retrieving the girl while she lingered in the Dongai. No doubt as soon as their presence was announced, she would rush to the living world. That was Alquiora's opportunity. Before we go there, I have something I want to say to all of you. In our last trip to the real world, Shaolong managed to spill the beans about the existence of our group which means it's safe to assume that Soul Society knows about the Espada by now. Despite that, Grimjow, you're likely the only one they have only information on, even if it is likely just your name. 
Because of that, I want you to refrain from saying your rank, status, or even your name to any Shinigami we may fight. This mostly just applies to Yami and myself, Naruto said. Mixed reactions from the group. Alquiora and Grimjaw were stoic, because the latter was already briefed on this information. Wonderwise groaned something in that strange high-pitched voice of his, and Yami scratched his scalp. Eh, if you say so. I won't say anything. The Decima said stupidly. Let us go. Okuyora said simply, when Naruto was finished talking. He pressed his finger against the air, and the five Arankar watched as a garganta opened right before their eyes. It closed, and exactly three minutes later it opened again in the real world. The first crack of light peered through the void, and Naruto grimaced. Ugh, this place makes me sick. So many humans everywhere, and it's so damn bright, he commented, looking towards his group. Alquiora had already taken off in another direction in the void, which left Grinjao, Yami, and Wonderwise with him. All right, boys, you ready to tear some Shinigami a new asshole? He smirked, as Yami cheered right beside him. Grimjaw was still sulking, but he looked a little more excited now that he was actually here. The Garganta opened completely, directly over a spot where most of the Shinigami reinforcements were training. Grimjaw, I don't want to steal your prey, but would you mind if I took the Kurosaki kid for around this time? You can stay here and fight these guys, Naruto said. Grimjaw glared at the Primera for a second before he scoffed. Whatever, I don't care. Just leave him alive for me to kill, he said. Naruto grinned before he crossed his fingers behind his back. Can do. I'll leave these guys to you three. Looks like there are four of them down there, including a captain, he lied. He uncrossed his fingers before he rushed away to find Ichigo. The other three looked at each other before they stepped out of the Garganta. We came out at a fun place, didn't we? Yami remarked before he received lackluster reactions from the group. Grimjaw didn't look at him, and Wonder Weiss was still spacing out. Hey, we're going, new guy. How long are you gonna space out? He shouted before he noticed that Wonder Weiss was playing with a moth, trying to catch it. Ugh, looks like we've got another weirdo in our group, he said. Down below, the Shinigami who were doing Bankai training noticed the ripple in the sky and the four Arankar that stepped out of the void. The Arankar versus the four Shinigami there, Hitsugaya Toshiru, Matsumoto Ranjuku, Madare Mikaku and Ayasegawa Yumichika. Arankar. No way, it's too soon. Yumichika cried, stopping the Bankai training he was going through to stare up at the multitude of Arankar. The Shinigami witnessed one go off to the side elsewhere, but he was too fast for anyone to stop him. Yami stretched as he walked in the sun but he didn't have any time to do anything else as he drew his large Zanpakutu and blocked a sword attack from a Shinigami down below. Tenth Division Captain. Hitsugaya Tushiru, he introduced. Yami was about to retort with his own introduction before he remembered what Naruto said about that. He wisely kept his mouth shut. Ikaku and Yumichika both stared down the blue-haired Arankar, not knowing what to say. The vicious grin on his face made them highly unnerved and Ikaku and Yumichika had already released their Zanpakutu. Ranjiku was facing Wonderwise, and looking profoundly confused on whether or not she should fight him. The limit was already released, and Hitsugaya was already in his shirk eye. He swung his dragon of ice at Yami, bringing it back as Yami was encased in the frozen water. That is, right before the ice cracked and Yami burst forth from it unharmed. What the hell was that? It got chilly for a second, he mocked. Hitsugaya grunted, even with the limit lifted he was still having trouble? Was this Arankar an Espada or something? Even with the limit lifted, it looks like I still need my Bankai, he thought to himself, as he held his sword out in front of him. Water and ice rushed into existence from his Zanpakutu. Bankai! Daigirin Hyorinmaru, one! He shouted, as he grew dragon wings of ice, and the lotus petals behind him came into existence once again. He readied himself for the fight. Over to the side, Grimjow hadn't even drawn against the Kaku and Yumichika, though Yumichika was already getting worn out against the former Espada. He smacked the fifth seat silly without his Zanpakutu, looking bored all the while. That was, before he noticed the captain's bankai that was out in full force. Hey, Yami. 
Let's switch. Let me take that kid you're fighting, and you can have these three scrubs over here. He shouted, as he muscled Yami out of his turf. By force. Grimjow, bastard. The Decima shouted, as he flew over to where the non-captain Shinigami were located. They didn't really look all that strong, and Grimjow had already messed one of them up. It was pretty disappointing. TCH, whatever. I guess I'll just clean up the rest of this trash here. While Yami grappled with the others, Grimjow surveyed his new Bankai using opponent. A fucking kid was all what this captain was, but he did have the luxury of a Bankai. Hetsugaya was surveying him anxiously. Blue hair, you are Grimjow Jigerjax, correct? The Septima Espada. Hitsugaya asked tentatively, trying to get a grasp on who his opponent was. Grimjow smirked. Did Shalong tell you that? The name is Grimjow, but I ain't an Espada anymore. It still won't stop me from kicking your ass, even if I only have one arm, he said, drawing his Zanpakutu with his single arm. With brutalizing speed, Grimjow flashed right in front of Hitsugaya. The young captain balked at Grinjao's sonido skills, just getting his ice wings up in time to guard. Still, Grinjao's blade smashed against the ice, breaking off a good chunk of it. Hitsugai tried to retaliate, but Grinjao thrust the midair ice forward with his Zanpakutu, blinding the captain and halting his attack. Grinjao chuckled before he held his Zanpakutu to the side with his one arm, firing a syro from his palm at the disoriented captain. Hitsugai shook the ice out of his face before he flew to the left of the attack. He rushed forward towards his Arankar opponent, sword at the ready. Hitsugaya's Zanpakuta clanged against Grimjow's as the two fought, Hitsugaya pressing the one-armed Grimjow back with his hard, quick, and heavy strikes. Still, Grimjow blocked every one of them, but when Hitsugaya was finished attacking, Grimjow's arm was frozen. Is this all there is to a captain-class Shinigami? Your Bankai is barely more impressive than that other Shinigami. He taunted, shaking loose his arm from the ice, which had only frozen over superficially. He used Sonido again, flashing out of existence and slashing off Hitsugaya's other wing completely and wounding his shoulder. Hitsugaya gasped in pain and he stumbled in place. The young captain then plummeted to the earth, his balance lost and his shoulder wounded. Tai Cho, Ranjika cried, as she began focusing her efforts on Yami. With the captain gone, it seemed like the Shinigami were in deep trouble. Over on the other side of town, Ichigo rushed out of the visored hideout after he had felt Grimjow's Ryatsu. His will and his abilities were at their peak after his month-long training of how to use his hollow in battle, and after all that was done he could keep his mask on for approximately eleven seconds before it cracked. It was better than nothing, and with his new abilities he was confident that he could beat Grimjow. He sped through the skies of town, rushing to wherever the Ryatsu was so he could finally defeat Grimjow in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He ran into Naruto approximately a half mile away from the visored warehouse. The blonde hair, the relatively short stature, red eyes, the masked fox ears that curved underneath his eyes, and the war paint as stigma. He matched the errand card that was there on that night. You. You, you were there on that night. You're the other errand card that was there with Grimjow. He shouted as Naruto grinned at him cheekily. This kid had guts. Hmm, so you did notice me after all, he mused. Get out of my way. I'm not interested in fighting you. Ichigo murmured, as he drew his Zanpakutu. Naruto raised an eyebrow, before he sighed and shook his head. I know you're looking for Grimjow at the moment, and he is here in the human world. You're still sore from your last defeat with him, so obviously you want to fight him now. But, he released his orange Ryatsu, letting it wash all over Ichigo. The substitute Shinigami, sweating, as he stared with shock at Naruto. I don't really feel like letting you pass right now. I hope that's okay, he said sarcastically. I think you'll find that I'm a suitable substitute for Grimjow now. He released his Ryatsu a little bit more. Why you V got my attention? Ichigo wheezed, before the orange boy charged up some black and red Ryatsu. Bankai, he shouted, as the familiar robe and black blade entered into view. Naruto looked at it, a little amused by how different it was from a normal Bankai. Oh, that's the infamous Bankai, huh? The one that lost to Grimjow so easily? He asked. It can't be helped, 
if you're going to be Grimjow's substitute, then I'll show you how much I've changed in this past month, he said, as he placed a hand on his face. Naruto glared in confusion as Ryatsu was formed near his face. Ichigo brought his hand down, and in its place a very distinctive hollow mask appeared. It even had the black hollow eyes so customary of their race. Naruto's eyes widened as the mask appeared and Ichigo's Ryatsu grew tremendously. It was clearly a spot a level, even though he would no match for him at all. What did you do? He asked, before he growled at the Shinigami turned hollow. Sorry. No time to explain, Ichigo said. His voice had gotten far more gravelly, like there was the presence of two individuals rather than just one. It also sounded hollow-like. He flashed out of existence, the dual bank eye and hollow mask power giving him incredible speed. He appeared before Naruto, a Getsuga flaring on his Zanpakutu, as he released the wave of Ryatsu when he was right next to Naruto. The Primera Espada backflipped over the Ryatsu, landing higher in the air than Ichigo. He heard a whoosh of noise behind him, and sensed Ichigo standing right above him. The visor slashed at Naruto, and Naruto's fist shot out at Ichigo. The blade made contact with the skin, but Naruto's hero was holding strong, and Ichigo failed to injure him. Ichigo, for all he was worth was surprised just how resilient this Erenkar was, and how even in hollow form he was losing the advantage. Naruto's movements were smooth and fast, and there was little error in his technique. Naruto grinned, before he used a quick sonido to get past Ichigo quite easily. He thrust his palm out trying to impale Ichigo, but the boy redirected the force of the strike with his Zanpakutu, parrying the attack. He counterattacked with a forward stab, but Naruto bypassed it and grabbed the blade. Ichigo tried to wrestle it from Naruto's grasp, but Naruto flipped into the air, effectively hand standing on the edge of the Zanpakutu. With his opponent bound tightly, he snapped forward with a 360-degree hook kick from that odd position. A portion of Ichigo's mask broke off as the kick impacted the left side of his face. The force wrestled Naruto loose from the blade, as Ichigo skidded back a distance away. Naruto flipped onto the ground, his wacky movements becoming a little too much for Ichigo to handle. So, what the hell did you do to yourself? Naruto asked cockily, as the battle turned out to be easier than he expected. That last kick of his had taken off half of Ichigo's mask. I told you, I don't have time to explain. Ichigo panted. While he was out of breath and injured, Naruto was unscratched and hardly out of breath. The battle was too one-sided. Jeez, kid. Even with that increase in your powers, you still suck this badly. Where's all that talk about how much you've improved over the past month now, huh? Shut up. Ichigo shouted. How does it feel, kid? Knowing that even with all the hard work you've done this past month, you're still going to lose to me. You're still going to die, because I'm going to have no mercy on you. And then while I'm at it, I'll go ahead and kill all your family and friends. Slowly. Slowly and horrifically they'll all die. Naruto cackled, the grumpy mood he'd been having during his time with Aizen lifting somewhat. He was beginning to go back to his old self. Bastard. Don't you dare. Now I know why Grimjow hates you so much. You always have this damnable furrowed look on your face, and whenever one thing goes in your favor you get overconfident. Even though you're so damn weak, despite that huge pool of Ryatsu you've got. It's a crime to be that weak when you have potential to be so strong, something that needs to be punished, he trailed off, before he laughed uproariously. He looked around, before he pointed at himself. How, huh, what's that? You want me to be the one that punishes you? Well, if you insist I'll happily oblige, he shouted very loudly before he loudly. Ichigo looked at him oddly. Are you insane? He asked. You'd better prepare yourself, kid. Because, he moaned in ecstasy as an idea formed in his head. I'm gonna rip your fucking heart out, he growled, like a feral animal ready to attack its prey. Ichigo suddenly looked very uncomfortable and one could tell that even behind his mask. Naruto's bizarre dialogue made Ichigo pause for just a second, but that was all the Primera Espada needed to exploit the opening. He used Sonido to get in his guard and directly behind him, before Ichigo could even react properly. He grasped the Zanpakutu with his bare hand and pulled, trying to wrench it from his grasp. 
He wrapped his other arm around Ichigo's neck, squeezing him in a chokehold. Ichigo gasped for breath, and Naruto spoke up. Seeing your kind trying to imitate us hollows make me very upset. When I get upset, I have the tendency to get a teensy tiny bit violence, if you know what I mean. I haven't felt this bloodlusted in a long, long time, before I entered Aizen's service. You seem to bring out the worst in me, kid, and I thank you for that. Let's make this fun, shall we? He whispered. With one firm tug, Naruto wrenched the Zanpakutu from Ichigo's grasp and threw it across the sky. Ichigo gasped in surprise as his weapon went flying over the horizon before it got stuck in a rooftop a distance away. He tried to free himself from Naruto's grip, but since then Naruto had wrapped his free arm around Ichigo's midsection. The other one remained around his neck, choking the life out of Ichigo. First, let us get rid of this damn mask. Naruto muttered before he placed his on the side of the mask. He tugged with all might, watching the mask material crack underneath the pressure. Ichigo was howling as his Ryatsu was beginning to act up. It was leaking from the opening on where Naruto was pulling on the mask. Naruto grunted, before he lifted the mask clean off of Ichigo's face. Black and red Ryatsu flowed out from Ichigo's face, and his visor transformation became undone as his Ryatsu went back to normal Bankai levels. His face exposed, and Naruto got to look at it again. Ah, that's better. You have no idea how much rage seeing that mask adorn your face provided. Now that you're just a Shinigami again, my anger has diminished, he said before he flashed forward. He kicked Ichigo right in the stomach, knocking the wind out of him. Ichigo plummeted towards earth at an incredibly high velocity, so much so that he would make a wide crater when he impacted. Naruto appeared on the ground before Ichigo did, holding his arms out like he was going to catch him. But, at the last second, Naruto instead gave him a brutal roundhouse kick straight to the head, tempered by Ryatsu. It almost caved in his skull completely. Ichigo skid down the street clumsily, made a deep skid in the road before he stopped. Naruto sauntered up to him casually, standing over him as he looked at the defeated boy. He was bruised and beaten all over. There was no way he could move about in that condition, even with Bankai. Tsugi no Mai. Hakurin, came a female voice from behind him. Naruto turned around and gave an oh please look, before he dodged the oncoming blast of ice easily. This female Shinigami he had seen at the invasion around a month ago, and she had gotten taken out super easily by Grimjow in one strike. He flashed right next to her, and before she could react had backhanded her right across the face. Rukia! Ichigo shouted as he struggled to get up. Don't move! Naruto shouted before he flashed over to Ichigo, who was struggling to get up. He charged up an orange zero and placed it next to Ichigo's head, creating a point-blank attack that was sure to kill him in one hit. It's been fun, kid. Don't believe that it hasn't been. But now it's about time for you to say nighty-night. Naruto muttered as Ichigo's eyes widened. His body was out of it and wouldn't respond. Even if he was just a few kicks and a removal of his mask, Naruto's attacks were strong and just a few of them was enough to bring him down for good. The orange lit up his face significantly, causing the Primera Espada to look considerably more evil as he was about to blast Ichigo's head into oblivion. However, before he could fire it, another Siro rushed towards Naruto's body. This one was red in color, and Naruto dodged it quickly, almost too late. My, my, I don't really like butting in during Shinigami fights, but... I guess it really can't be helped this time, came a voice from on top of a nearby roof. Naruto glared, and looked to the side, before his eyes widened. There was a blonde-haired human carrying a Zanpakutu standing on the rooftop, but not just anyone. He had seen this human. No Shinigami before. Hirako. Ichigo whispered. In his first attack on Konoha, this Shinigami had been called there as backup to help fight him. It had ended in the Shinigami's loss, but Naruto had never forgot that opponent. You, I remember you, Naruto said. That wasn't the response Shinji had expected from Naruto, and he narrowed his eyes at the prospective opponent. Zatso. I don't remember ever seeing you before, though. Who are you, Erinkar? Naruto shut his eyes for a moment, placing a hand on his forehand in deep thought. He finally removed it from his face, 
releasing his Ryatsu in order to intimidate his opponent. No. It doesn't really matter, but I will say this. How's Kanoha doing? he said shikily. Shinji's eyes widened as he took in the Erenkar's Ryatsu, and he remembered this exact feel and the bitter taste of defeat he had gone through. The only loss he had ever suffered in his entire life. You. Volpa C., he muttered, taking on a much more serious approach. Naruto grinned and raised an eyebrow in confusion at the odd title, before remembering that Soul Society assigned code names to Hollows. Volpus C? Is that what Soul Society calls me these days? Well, whatever, it's not like I care about some stupid code name. I just hope you've gotten stronger than you were all those years ago. Otherwise, he trailed off, placing his hand on the hilt of his Zanpakutu before drawing it slowly. The silver gleam of the cutlass shined in the sun. I'm gonna kill ya. Before either combatant could move towards each other, another flash and a new presence made its way onto the battlefield before them. The figure that appeared placed its hand on Naruto's Zanpakutu, effectively sheathing it. Alquiara? Naruto asked quizzically. Indeed, the Quinta Espada stood next to Naruto, holding back the Primera Zanpakutu from being drawn. The mission is complete. We're going back. We don't soul society to gain any more information on us. Alquiora said simply, before a golden light engulfed both Arankar. Over where the others were fighting, a golden light dropped on those Arankars as well. It seemed that Hitsugaya had somehow avoided being defeated by Grimjow's last attack, as there was a multitude of ice all over the place. The Ryatsu over there also indicated that Grimjow and Hitsugaya were engaged in a fierce battle. That is, until the negation snatched up Grimjow and the others. Negation. Ichigo whispered. Shinji glared up at the blonde and black-haired Arankars, who were rising into the garganta in the sky. He didn't even get to don his mask. It seems you've gained some kind of new power, but is this all you can achieve with it? This is the end. There is no way you can do anything now. The sun has already sunken into our grasp, Olquiora said cryptically as he stared down at Ichigo from the negation. Wait, Volpasi, were you the one who destroyed the village of Kanoha one hundred years ago? He shouted up to the sky. Naruto smirked, and Alquiora looked at his leader stoically. That is none of your concern, he hissed cheekily, as he disappeared into the Garganta completely alongside Alquiora. Ichigo and Rukia stood in awe of the Erenkar, and Shinji pounded his fist onto the panes of the roof. Damn it! Who was that, Ichigo? asked Rukia, as she helped Ichigo to his feet. The boy had gotten very bloodied up during his fight with the Erenkar, so much that he seemed unable to move. I don't know. He didn't give me his name or anything. I don't even know what member of the Espada he is or even if he is a member at all. All I know is that I was no match for him, he said sadly. He was threatening to fall back into another depression. A truly mysterious Erenkar. Rukia commented. It was on all their minds. 